Without further ado, let's talk about the power of authentic conversation. So um, today we're going to talk about that, what is an authentic conversation. And in its most simple form, what are we even talking about? We're going to get into some definitions, provide some examples, share some perspective, and then I'm going to issue an invitation and a challenge. So let's, let's talk about why. Why authentic conversations? Because in the last 15 years, I've had the good fortune of working in several organizations across several industries. And technology industries, media, healthcare, and now financial services. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of tools. There are a lot of techniques. There are a lot of processes and initiatives, technologies, that anybody can use to, to, to make a difference in an organization. And they're all good tools. And I'm a fan of all of them. Emergenetics is one of the awesome tools that we use in our organization. And I'll talk more about that. But some people use strength finders. Some people use emotional intelligence tools. Clearly, people use 360 tools, and on and on and on. When, when I ask myself a really tough question, and we boil it all down, what is the most valuable aspect of all of these tools and all these initiatives? And what I believe it boils down to is an authentic conversation. The people get together and start having a personal connection and talking about what matters most. And so I believe people and organizations that have authentic conversations have an opportunity to become transformational. And people and organizations who norm in a transactional communication or a transactional conversation tend to struggle with relationships, have trouble meeting their goals or accomplishing projects, and ultimately driving culture. So let's take a high level look at the different type of conversations that we have on a daily basis. Um, transactional being the first type, this is like buy gas, give money. A basic exchange, it's rote, it's the norm, everybody does it, it's socially acceptable, um, it's something that we do in passing, it's absolutely become a habit, and it is the status quo. As you can see from the image, this is somewhat boring, sterilized. I'm not saying that we have to get rid of all transactional communication, but what I'm saying is let's start to notice how often we go to a place of transactional communication and what that is creating for ourselves, our relationships, and the organization. The next type is an authentic conversation. So if you look at this picture, you can see a very different energy that's being exchanged between these people. Notice that all of their faces are in contact. Their eyes are in contact. The communication is engaging enough that everyone is in. They're leaning in. They're interested in what's going on. And while it may seem like a simple thing, that's a game changer in teams, in one-on-one -on -one relationships, in organizations. So it's real. It's genuine. It's true. And it's beyond the norm, which is, sounds like a simple thing, but it's actually a, a big step to move beyond status quo and go to a deeper level. So what is this idea of transformational then? If you're not going to be transactional and you're going to start having authentic conversations, then how does that become transformational? Well, it's, it's by definition when there is a major or a complete change in whatever it is that you're doing. So it could be a conversation. It could be a relationship. It could be a team or building a team. It might be a major project or initiative. But it's how the communication changes the quality of that thing such that it's a major or complete change. And one of the interesting things about it is people might say, well, how fast does that happen? It can happen in a moment. It can happen over time. It can be two months, two minutes, two years, 20 years. And I know in this moment, if I said to everyone on this call and everyone who would watch the video of this in the future, think about a time when you've had an authentic conversation and it changed in that moment. You had the authentic conversation. Some things were exchanged. Some words and some feelings were exchanged that were not exchanged before. And things were different from that moment forward. I'm sure you can think of a lot of examples. And that same process is true for everyone. It can happen for anyone at any time. So let's look at a specific example, a simple example. I could walk through the halls and meet Mark. And I could say, hey, Mark, how's it going? You know, the weather's getting cold again. Not looking forward to that. Hey, have a good day. You know, it's nice. It's cordial. It's fine. 
but there's nothing authentic necessarily about that. If we advance that example and say, well, what if I challenged myself to have an authentic conversation with Mark in the hallway, the same hallway, and just turn it up a little bit, have a personal connection. Hey, Mark, I was thinking about you this weekend. Thank you for going above and beyond on this project. You checked in with me several times, and you made sure I have what I need. And that may seem like a simple thing, but it means a lot to me, and it means a lot to our partnership. Thank you. A very different type of conversation. Simple, nothing complex about it per se, but what it creates in that relationship is rapport and um, respect and appreciation and acknowledgement and trust, all very important things that were not there potentially before or maybe not um, reiterated in the same way as before. So what may seem like a simple change creates an opening. And that's the thing that I really want to land in this example is authentic conversations create an opening. And that opening, think of it like an open door so that other things can start to happen that would not have happened otherwise. As you can see, deeper rapport, appreciation, respect, and increased trust over time. So what are the key elements? You might be thinking, OK, this sounds pretty simple. What are, well, how do you know if you're doing it well, or what can you kind of build skill around or measure against? Well, the first one is your intention. Um, Carol Dweck writes about mindset. It's a fantastic book if you haven't read it, and we use it in our leadership development and executive coaching. Going into a conversation with a mindset of how can I be supportive and empowering and compassionate and appreciative of this individual is a powerful intention. On the reverse, someone could go in and have an intention of just getting through this conversation or dominating this conversation. So the intention that you go in with absolutely matters and will affect the authenticity and the outcome. Honesty. In a moment, I'm going to show a research slide from Kuzis and Posner, who have done research since 1987 on the number one attribute of admired leaders it's authenticity. I mean, it's honesty. So it's, it's tremendously important to the value of the relationship and to the power of an authentic conversation is just being honest. And then authenticity or that idea of being genuine. And there's a congruence there that has to take place, which is the next item of are your words matching your facial expressions and your tonality and your body language? So that's the idea of authenticity through congruence. And finally, the outcome. <clears throat> Everything speaks, right? So as you get into a conversation, you can tell by the feedback before that person even speaks. If, you're, if you have your sensory acuity up, you can see their body language. You can hear their tone. And you can notice the energy that they're projecting to see the quality of the authentic conversation that you're having. So here's that research I was talking about a minute ago. And this is, this is powerful research. If you haven't read Credibility, 15 countries since 1987, they've run three full studies, 87, 2002, and 2010. Across all 15 countries, the number one desired characteristic of admired leaders was honesty, which is a powerful, powerful reminder for us of being honest in an authentic conversation. Oftentimes, people will say, I don't want to say something to someone. And they, we have this idea that people are fragile. And uh, that's absolutely not the case. People aren't fragile. And in fact, they want to know the real feedback because the only way I or anyone at Oppenheim or anywhere can make good um, informed change and progress is to understand what's going on. An IBM study from a different perspective in a different context found that the number two reason project fails, or projects do fail, is because of poor communication. So that um, the Denver um, luggage system that they tried to roll out that was an epic failure, hundreds of millions of dollars spent, completely abandoned, I believe it was in 2005, was because of poor communication. In fact, that project leadership group went out and engaged firms to tell them if this was a good idea and evaluate the idea. Um, multiple firms came back and said, don't do it. And they just kept going forward 
poor communication, not being authentic, and ultimately abandon the project to hundreds of millions of dollars and years of work lost. And then and I have here um, Dr. Gail Browning and Dr. Wendell Williams who have put together all this amazing work in Emergenetics are echoing the same research as we use Emergenetics in our, pro, or in our programs we use it to bring out that authentic conversation and start to understand the employees, the leaders, um, the teams, and, and the entire organization in, in a different way and start to have a more authentic conversation based on preferences and um, strengths. So it's vital, as you can see. At the, and, it, and that's I'm not trying to speak to the choir here, I guess, or convince the choir that, that it's important to do this. What I would like to say is, how often are you doing it? Is it happening enough? So here's some real examples. I just thought back and I thought, well, what if I took some real examples from the last two weeks? What would I talk about? And the first one is a, an AV technician that I met while he was setting up a presentation area for um, a large uh, performance management presentation that we were putting on. And I could tell that his energy was different. And I just looked at him and I said, how are you doing? And in that moment, he stopped and looked at me and said, it's been tough. And he launched into something that I never expected. I mean, we were literally setting up for a presentation. The presentation is going to happen in 15 minutes. And he looks at me and says, I've had a couple of deaths in my family. And, and, and launches into this conversation about what he's going through. And that conversation would not have even happened without checking in on him and noticing the difference in his energy. And I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to turn into a counselor or anything, but I'm saying caring about the people around us and, and being willing to check in on them matters. And he was able to share some things that he needed to share, and I was able to support him in a way that he needed at the time. A second example is um, I was working with a new leader who's taking over a team. And she, in this case, had some, she knew she was coming into some difficult situations with some people on her team that had um, some existing challenges that were clearly articulated to her when she came in. And so what she said when we started talking was, I want to give these people a chance and I want to get to know them without the biases or biases from the previous people. You know, what what might that look like? How could we go about that? And my recommendation and what we worked around was for her to start to create a personal connection with those people on her own terms and take it from a clean slate. So using authentic conversation, she asked some powerful questions to these people. And some of them were, um, before we dive into work, I'd love to get to know you better. Is it OK to ask you some questions? And her first question was, what, what do you want most in a relationship with your leader. And then she was quiet and would let the individual speak. When you think about great leaders from your past, what characteristics did you appreciate? What are things that leaders do that build trust with you? What are things that leaders do that break trust with you? And, and putting into play a type of a conversation that those people had never had before as her opening volley so that she could get to know those people as individuals, create that personal connection, open an authentic conversation from the beginning, and then let that relationship grow. And over time, she will be able to tell whether the stories that she heard from the past were true um, or not. I'd say a final example here is something that I'm very proud of and Oppenheimer Funds is very proud of. It was that this year, in 2014, we rolled out a completely new enterprise performance management solution. So what I tried to do with these stories is give sort of the day-to-day, -day, small, easy, one-to-one. -one. And I want to end on an enterprise story. And that um, performance management solution, in being candid, was that the performance management solution we had before wasn't working. And we knew it, and the employees knew it, and it just wasn't driving performance. <coughs> Excuse me. So about a year and a half ago, we started piloting a new performance management solution. It was based on authentic conversations. And it was simple. 
and I'm going to do a compare and contrast here. The previous performance management solution was open to interpretation. There was a lack of structure. Um, employees and leaders had infrequent conversations. Um, there was no um, consistent tracking method. Employees and leaders often had surprises at one-on-ones and year-end conversations because they weren't on the same page and their, their authentic conversations weren't happening. So with this new performance management solution that we call active performance management, we uh, rolled it out after piloting it for a year and a half and making the, con um, the customizations as we went. We rolled it out to the whole organization and the invitation was to have quarterly or monthly conversations. We'd leave it open to you and we left it to, um, to be very organic with the people in the sense that we're going to provide you an online structure where you can log all of your conversations. Managers and employees can see the notes from each of their conversations. Some of them use the monthly conversations, some of them use the quarterly conversations. And the invitation and the training that we had each quarter was around how to be more authentic in those conversations. So in quarter one, we rolled out, here's what active performance management is. Quarter two, we rolled out, here's how to have authentic conversations. Have a lot of them, and here's how you do it. In quarter three, we rolled out, perform, or here's um, personal development and how to have active con or authentic conversations around your personal development. And in, in the fourth quarter, we, ro we rolled out how to have an authentic conversation at year end and make sure that your leader can speak to your impact and accomplishments for the year. So it's a really cool way, and, and so you might say, well, how did it go? I mean, how, this is a pretty major thing. How did it turn out? Well, we ran our employee survey. We run it every year, and we got the results back for third quarter of 2014, and we have double-digit improvements in performance management across the enterprise in almost every group. There are a couple groups that had single-digit improvements, but it's unanimously better than it was before, and we're just in year one quality of the conversations are better, people feel more connected, and most important, which was kind of the biggest pain point for us, was that people aren't going into those year-end conversations now with a surprise. And that surprise being, my leader and I are not on the same page about my performance, and I'm not happy with the outcome. So we're very proud of what we've done, how far we are, and um, what that can be for 2015 and beyond. Okay, so we've had a lot of conversation here. Let's kind of bring it all into perspective. And how do you develop this skill? So the how doesn't matter as much. This isn't a silver bullet and it's not a you have to do it the same way every time type of conversation. The biggest thing is the inten uh, intention and the authenticity of going into this conversation. In fact, what's cool about this is you don't even have to be that good at it to have people understand your intention and where you're coming from and meet you in the middle. So that's one of the best things about as you start to do this more often and you get better at it, you'll recognize that once you come from that intention and that place of authenticity, people will come and meet you and life becomes much easier. Second bullet here is that this is free. Think of all the tools you have to pay a lot of money for. Right? And you've got to have people come out and experts train you and certify you and all this stuff and enterprise contracts and all that. Authentic conversation is free and it's something that we can all do. Anybody can do it. And you might ask, well, in your enterprise rollout, didn't you have some naysayers? Didn't you have some people who didn't want to do it? Absolutely. What's amazing about it is that as the group norms start to change, the naysayers start to notice that people are having really good success around them and the few that resisted have moved closer. It doesn't mean they've jumped on board and become a, an advocate per se, but they're moving closer because they're watching people have results, which is pretty powerful. And then um, does it take time? Yeah, it takes time and practice to get good. If you want to be a great singer or run marathons, you've got to practice, so the same is true. The, the cool thing about having authentic conversations is you can practice every day. So do you use authentic, authentic conversations all the time, Nate? No, I don't. 
and I don't think anybody should walk into every single conversation and try to be um, have a deep conversation with all of them, but it, it is an opportunity to strategically pick the conversations that you have each day. Okay, so here's my challenge. Bring it all home. First challenge, notice the quality of your conversation. As you move through the day and you go back into your life and your work and with your clients and your family and your friends, notice the quality of your conversation. Are you having transactional conversations or authentic conversations? It's fine either way. You don't need to judge it. What I'm inviting you to do is raise the bar. Have at least one authentic conversation per day. Try it out. Try it on like a coat. Try different things. Try it with different people. Right? And just raise your skill about having an authentic conversation. And the second one is to notice the quality of your internal conversation. Now this one is a step up. The story that you tell yourself about yourself all day long is your identity. It literally becomes your identity and how you present yourself to the world. So these, these conversations that we have with ourselves become the most important conversations of our life because they define our life. So the question is, are you having healthy, honest, and authentic conversations with yourself? And the goal here again is to check in, notice, and start to raise the bar. So that's what I have. I hope, I hope it works. I hope it helps and that you enjoy authentic conversations. Again, I want to thank you, Mark, and it looks like we're ready to turn it over to Q&A. Thanks, Nate. That, that was a, a really great presentation, and I love that you ended with something so practical as to uh, what, we can, what, what we can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis or on a regular basis in terms of uh, having these kinds of authentic conversations. Uh, and, and that was one, one element that I wanted to, to ask about, which is how do you extend that practicality? What, what, are, what are some ways, you know, from that, that's great for an individual, how do you do that on a team level? Is there uh, some practical things that you could uh, give a leader of a team, for example, uh, ways to encourage his or her team members to do that or to do that within the team setting? Absolutely. So the first one is the leader it really helps when a leader will model it. So if the leader starts having more authentic conversations with the people on the team, that automatically starts to change the group norm or the group dynamic and others tend to follow. Um, the second opportunity I would say is for t the team members to have a conversation about authentic conversations in the team dynamic. So. Um, you can have an open conversation. Like here's one just really simple model that leaders sometimes use. It's a meeting that's called Anything Goes. So you literally invite your team to a meeting and say, you know what, we're just going to have an Anything Goes conversation and I want you to come and ask the questions that have been on your mind or um, on your heart and the things that you want to say that maybe you haven't said before. And there are no consequences. And by modeling that that's okay and that there's a reward that everybody can get from having that type of conversation, it becomes really practical. That, that's that's uh, a really good example um, and something that I think that uh, we've heard a lot in a lot of the other uh, presentations as well, which is just this idea that when people can see it modeled, particularly from a leadership perspective, particularly from a top-down kind of way, it becomes that much more inculcated into the culture of, of what you're trying to do. So I think that's a, a great uh, perspective on that. One question that, that sort of sprang to, to my mind too, the, and basically the form of what we're doing here is what really drove this question. The world is becoming so much more global. Everyone is virtual. Everyone is connecting in on a you know, number of different levels from all different locations. It seems like this kind of thing would be challenging in a virtual environment. How do you navigate that? And I know Oppenheimer has offices all around the country. You know, how does that work? Yeah, so I think it's always wise to be um, culturally aware, and so it depends on where you're interacting and what the culture is. Um, for example, in Sweden, it's um, very important to be on time, and it's very important to um, keep business and person personal separate, right? So it's just a simple example. It depends on where you're at and what you're doing on how you're going to be authentic, at what times you're going to be authentic, and if it's even appropriate to be authentic. So you might have to, in some cases internationally, build some rapport using cultural norms first 
and then and then if it's appropriate, find a way to kind of tailor that. And it might look very different than it does in the states. And I, I call that sensory acuity. So part of it is being informed, and part of it is the sensory acuity in the moment of reading the sign. Uh, that's that's really helpful. And and probably too, you know, the concept of you can still have authentic conversations over Skype or over yeah. you know webinar or over phone. Uh, it's just the putting that intention out there. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with asking permission. So if you can't see someone's face, <laughs> ask permission. You mm -hmm. know, put it into the chat or say it in, into the air, and then just again use your sensory acuity. If it's voice, then notice tonality. If it's words, ask questions. And I think that's one of the things about authentic conversations too. Is assumptions are the the root of all communication issues. So if you if you feel like there's something that's not clear and assumption is in play, ask a question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, that, Nate, that, that's, that's really uh, a great way of, I, I think, putting it into perspective that uh, it can start with something as easy as, as simply asking permission to have these kinds of conversations. And I think what this session has really demonstrated is that from that simple start, you can actually see true organizational change. You can actually measure this sort of thing and measure that effectiveness. And uh, that's one of the clear challenges that we face in, in this realm of how do you develop people? How do you realize uh, the potential of people within organizations? There's always that challenge around, well, how do we measure that? How do we know if what we're doing is working? And, and you've demonstrated, I think, some real clear ways to understand that, that there are ways to, to measure this sort of thing. Absolutely. Well, I think that we are right at about time. Thank you so much, Nate, for your time today. Uh, and thank you for being a wonderful uh, closing speaker to our first ever session. Thank you. This has been an honor. And I'm excited to um, continue to be a part of the Emergenetics Catalyst for learning and empowerment.